Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. And this will include, uh, first of all, the complete blood count. The complete blood count consists of a platelet determination and a differential count of white blood cells. In the modern day laboratory, many determinations are done by automation or by means of electronic devices. The red cell count and the white cell count are done uh, in many instances on the colder counter, an electronic device for making this kind of count. The colder counter determines the number and size of particles suspended in an electri electrically conductive liquid. And the cell count is done by forcing a suspension of cells in electrolyte to flow through a small aperture having an immersed electrode on each side. As a cell uh, passes through the aperture, it changes the resistance between the electrodes, and this produces a voltage pulse of short duration. And this will uh, change in magnitude depending on the size of the particle. The series of pulses is then electronically scaled and counted. As we watch the technician in the laboratory, we see that she is preparing a specimen of blood for the colder counter. In order to space out the particles for more accurate counting, as they pass through the aperture and between the electrodes, the dilution of blood is required. She is measuring uh, out a quantity of blood in the pipette and uh, introducing it into an isotonic solution. This will retain the cells uh, in good condition. She will further dilute this specimen in order to do the red blood cell count. A fresh pipette is used, taking out a different volume of blood. She will now uh, clean out the machine with uh, distilled water, make sure that there are no particles residual uh, in the uh, aperture or between the, the electrodes. She is setting the machine for the impulse that uh, will detect the red blood cells. Now she is introducing the specimen into the system. There is an external source of vacuum uh, which affects a column of mercury. This in turn draws in an exact quantity of the material of the suspension and working on a switching device as the mercury passes two switches the machine is turned on and off counting the cells within a given volume. The white blood cell count is done by lysing the red blood cells. As you see here uh, material is introduced which will destroy the red cells. The color chain change is obvious now all that remains are the white blood cells. The machine is reset for an impulse uh, that a threshold that will detect a larger particle as it passes through the aperture. It's cleaned again and the material is introduced into the system. Once again the count begins as the mercury passes the switch. And at the end of the count, the reading is taken from the dials on the machine. The hematocrit measures the proportion of cells in blood to the plasma. The hematocrit is determined by centrifuging a specimen of blood and it layers out into three layers as demonstrated here on our graphic representation. The top layer is the plasma, makes up somewhere in the neighborhood of 55% of the total specimen, shown here in yellow. Below that, the white cell layer is depicted in green. And still below that, the red blood cells are shown in a maroon colored layer. 
The normal hematocrit level varies from 40 to 47 percent in general. We're going to demonstrate the capillary method of uh, hematocrit determination. Our technician will, first of all, uh, mix the specimen of anticoagulated blood to get a good dispersion of cells. Then she will draw some of the blood into a capillary tube. Capillary action draws the blood well up into the tube and uh, enough is taken into the tube to allow a, an accurate determination of the layering effect following the centrifuging. The tip of the tube is sealed with a bit of clay and the upper end of the tube uh, remains open, of course, to allow atmospheric pressure to adjust as the centrifuging takes place. The specimen is placed into the machine and covered. It will be centrifuged at a speed of 12,000 RPM for a period of three minutes. At the end of three minutes of centrifuging, the sliding percentage scale is adjusted to the top and the bottom of the blood. And as you can see here, it has now layered into the plasma layer, a small buffy layer, and the red cell layer at the bottom. As we read on the scale, it shows that the hematocrit for this specimen of blood is in the neighborhood of 47%. is prepared uh, by using a right stain on the blood film that was collected from the finger puncture. First of all, the stain is added to the two cover slips. The stain is uh, allowed to flow over the complete surface of the slide. It's left in place for one minute, and then a buffering solution is added to the staining material. In this manner, uh, the acidic stain and the neutrophilic stain will be accomplished. The buffering solution is left in place for a period of three minutes, then the surfaces of the slide are washed with distilled water. They are then set aside and uh, allowed to dry. After they are completely dried, they will be mounted on a glass slide and examined under the oil immersion lens of the microscope. And in this, during this process, the various cells will be counted. The neutrophils uh, make up the largest number, the largest percentage of the white blood cells. And we see here under the microscope an excellent example of polymorphonuclear neutrophils. These are members of the granulocytic series derived from red bone marrow and of course constitute the body's first line of cellular defense. The lymphocytes make up from 20 to 40 percent of the differential count of white cells Lymphocyte shown here can be seen as a small mononuclear cell, a small amount of light blue cytoplasm around the darker blue nucleus. The function of the lymphocyte is to produce antibodies and is usually found late in the inflammatory process under microscopic section.
Monocytes make up 4 to 8 percent of the total white blood cell count. They are a large cell with a single lobulated nucleus. They're seen late in inflammation. Their function is to clean up the inflammatory site. They are known as the macrophages. Eosinophils are members of the granulocytic series derived from red bone marrow. They have eosinophilic staining granules in their cytoplasm. Their function is somewhat obscure. Although they are seen in increased numbers uh, during allergic manifestations and during parasitic infestations. The basophil is the third member of the granulocytic series. It uh, contains basophilic staining granules in its cytoplasm. Its function is rather obscure. It's thought that it may produce heparin at the site of inflammation. A platelet estimate is done on the basis of the number of clumps of platelets that appear in each oil immersion field of the microscope. The normal numbers uh, would be five or more clumps of platelets per field. The platelets have uh, numerous important functions. They are important in the initiation of the coagulation mechanism. They contribute to the retraction of the clot and they have a good deal to do with capillary integrity. Although the red cell count is done on the colder counter, the red cells are examined for color, size, and shape during the process of examining the stained smear. The role of platelets in clot retraction was mentioned earlier. This can be tested by incubating freshly drawn blood at 37 degrees centigrade for a period of 24 hours. The specimen on the left shows freshly drawn blood, while the specimen on the right shows the blood after it has stood for 24 hours. It, the retraction of the clot away from the sides and the bottom is visible. There are two coagulation studies of interest to the dentist, the prothrombin time and the partial thromboplastin time. The prothrombin time measures the extrinsic clotting mechanism and its ingredients, while the partial thromboplastin time measures the activity and the intrinsic clotting mechanism. The instrument used uh, in our laboratory is the fibrometer precision coagulation timer this is an electromechanical instrument designed to measure coagulation properties of plasma or serum for diagnostic use and for anticoagulant therapy control. It can be employed for most of the coagulation determin determinations now being used. Our technician will demonstrate the use of the instrument. The automatic pipette is being placed uh, and a certain amount of reagent will be drawn into the pipette automatically. This is placed into one of the preheated fibro cups on the instrument. Then the patient's plasma is drawn into a clean pipette. This in turn is added to the reagent and automatically the machine begins to mix and to count the time until it begins to sense a clot. The formation of a clot changes the resistance across the two probing electrodes. And at the end of the clotting period, the timer stops. The timing is measured in seconds and tenths of seconds. As shown here, the timing on this one was 22.0 seconds. I believe that was 22.5 seconds. At any rate, uh, it represents an abnormal 
or an abnormally long test. Following this, the technician wipes off the electrodes and the instrument is ready then for the next test. The same machinery and the same settings are used uh, for the partial thromboplastin time as for the prothrombin time. The reagents, however, are different for these different determinations. The instrument used to do uh, the hemoglobin determination is the Klett Summerson photoelectric colorimeter. In using this instrument, whole blood is added to a cyanide compound, converting it to cyanomethemoglobin. Our technician will now demonstrate the use of the instrument. First of all, the instrument is calibrated by using a blank made up of the reagent in a test tube. Calibration is done by setting the central dial at the midpoint while the calibrated dial is on zero. The unknown specimen is then placed in front of the photoelectric cells and the calibrated dial is turned then until the central dial is brought back to the midpoint. The final reading is taken, taken from the calibrated dial and uh, by multiplying this with a factor for conversion to grams per 100 cc's of whole blood, the hemoglobin determination is completed. Bacteriology studies are used primarily for the identification of organisms and to determine the effectiveness of antibiotics, a technique which is also referred to as antibiotic sensitivity testing. The gram stain is used for immediate identification of a specimen uh, submitted on a glass slide. For uh, this staining technique, gentian violet, grams iodine, alcohol, and safranin are used in turn. Our technician is going to demonstrate the gram staining technique. First of all, she will apply gentian violet to the slide surface for 30 seconds. Following this, uh, she will remove the excess stain, rinse with water, and go to the addition of the next reagent, grams iodine. This solution is left in place for 30 seconds also. Then uh, again, the excess staining material is rinsed off. Then the slide is cleared with uh, alcohol and again washed. And finally, the safranin solution is applied for the final staining. Again, this is left in place for 30 seconds. And uh, at the end of that period, the excess is washed off. The slide is blotted and dried and is then ready for viewing under the microscope. Next, our technician will demonstrate the processing of the swab that was submitted for culturing. After flaming the tube, she removes the swab and smears the surface of a blood auger plate. In order to distribute the material more evenly, uh, she will take a wire loop, which has been previously sterilized, and uh, we'll further distribute uh, the material around the surface of the plate. The plate is then incubated.
for a period of 24 to 48 hours. On one of these plates, uh, if multiple plates are done, antibiotic uh, discs can be placed and the zone of inhibition uh, can be determined after 24 hours. On a plain plate, uh, the colonies of organisms can be identified or removed for gram staining and further examination microscopically. As an example of the antibiotic sensitivity tests, here we have two multidiscs that are impregnated with eight different antibiotics and they show varying uh, zones of inhibition. You'll notice the one on the right, marked P, is penicillin. These are both staph uh, infections shown on uh, these plates. The one uh, that is being shown now is uh, sensitive to penicillin as demonstrated by the clear zone around the plate or around the uh, disc. And in this case, the uh, staph is insensitive or resistant to the action of penicillin since there is no zone of inhibition showing. Yeast or candida albicans can be grown out on uh, Sabrode's glucose agar. This is a good example of candida colonies growing on a petri dish uh, plated out with Sabrode's glucose agar. The other plate uh, that we see here is a, from a throat uh, culture and shows a distribution of uh, organisms, staph, streptococci, and yeast. The macroscopic portion of urinalysis includes simple qualitative biochemical tests using commercially prepared test strips. Our technician is going to demonstrate first the use of the Lilly test tape, which is used for glucose determination in the urine. Usually this is done on a random urine sample in a diabetic suspect. She will remove a portion of the tape from the container and insert it into the test tube containing urine from the suspected patient. After a brief exposure, the color change is observed on the test tape and it is compared to the color code on the test tape container. As we can see from our comparisons, the test tape has changed color and approximates the amount of glucose in the urine somewhere between the 1 plus and 2 plus levels. Lab sticks are manufactured by the Ames Company and can be used for multiple testing of the urine, including qualitative determinations for blood, bilirubin, ketones, glucose, and protein. Our technician has placed the test or the uh, lab stick in the urine sample, exposing it to uh, a known diabetic's urine and is now comparing the glucose level on the lab stick with the color coding on the side of the jar. You can see there are multiple color codings here which will indicate the five different areas that are being tested by the strip. The clinical laboratory has many applications in diagnosis. The dentist should familiarize himself thoroughly with the collection of the specimen for laboratory analysis, and he should familiarize himself also with the processing of the specimen in the laboratory so that he can interpret laboratory error as a possibility when the laboratory report does not match the clinical behavior of the disease. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.